So without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to our first speaker, who is actually the second speaker on the programme. Uh, we're just doing a little bit of swapping behind the scenes here. Um, and our our, so our first speaker for today is going to be Professor Sir Harry Burns, who lead, needs little introduction in Scotland. He was Chief Medical Officer for Scotland, of course, between 2005 and 2014, and is current Professor of Global Public Health at the University of Strathclyde and President of the British Medical Association. And throughout his career, Sir Harry has been driven by an interest in the science of wellness, of health inequalities, and of the factors that determine how long and how well we live. And the title of his talk today is Health Inequalities, Public Health Matters. Thank you, Sir Harry. OK, uh, I hope everyone can hear me and see these slides. Um, basically, my medical career has taken me to this conclusion. As a surgeon, for as a consultant for about five years in the East End of Glasgow, operating on people who were coming in with self-inflicted illness, you know, patients with recurrent acute pancreatitis and so on, you'd say to them, listen, John, if you don't stop drinking, you're going to die. And the response was routine. Um, yeah, I know I'm going to die. I know the booze is bad for me, but I don't care because life's really rubbish. And the conclusion I reached was, A, they don't need more surgery from me. What they needed was more well-being. And I left and did public health. And as I have gone on, I've become more and more convinced that this is the case. Health inequalities are caused by a lack of well-being, not too much illness. And sometimes as doctors, we forget that because pathology and pathogenesis of illness is often what we focus on rather than creating well-being. And it's an honour to be associated with a deep end GP's uh, event because the deep end GPs are the ones that I first came across that really got this. Um, so um, how do I change the slides here? Yeah. So health inequalities. Um, we sometimes think of Scotland as being the sick man of the UK, if not Europe. But if you look into the history of our life expectancy, this slide shows life expectancy going back 160 years. You can see that Scottish life expectancy throughout most of that time has been at about the European average. Um, you see the impact of the Second World War and the First World War there, but it's only around about the 1950s that we began to decline in life expectancy. And that arrow shows the rate of growth in life expectancy since the 1950s in the most affluent 20% of the population, whereas this shows the rate of growth in life expectancy in the poorest 20% of the population. And you can see that Scotland's relative decline in life expectancy relative to our other 16 Western European neighbours is largely due to a decline in well-being or a relative decline in well-being in the poorest sectors of the population. There's nothing inherent in, our, in us that makes us unhealthy. And this work was originally, uh, it came from Alistair um, McGilchrist, who was working at, in uh, Glasgow University at the time. And he began to question, like me, what was actually driving this widening in health inequalities. And what he did was he took mortality, all-cause mortality in the population in five-year age bands, drew it like this with a Scottish index of multiple deprivation along the bottom, death rates per 100,000 people in the most affluent 20%, down to death rates per 100,000 population in the most deprived 20% for each five-year age band. And he reduced the data on that slide to a single number by subtracting the best from the worst and dividing by the mean. And you come up with a number here that that represents the steepness of the inequality curve, the slope index of inequality. And if you do that across the population, you come up with a, a graph like this, and it shows an interesting thing. The widest inequalities are in young people. 
shoots up in the teenage years. It's at its, at its highest in the 20s, 30s, 40s. And inequality, relative inequality, is declining amongst elderly people. But we think about the common causes of death, the cancers, the heart disease, and so on. They tend to occur in older people. But they are the population where we see the, 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 the least relative inequality. So his next step was to take individual causes of death. Here's ischemic heart disease, plotted the slope index of inequality for that. And when you plot that, you see heart disease is a relatively low contributor to this great bulge in inequality in death rates in the younger working age people. So what's causing that bulge? Well, it's drugs, alcohol, suicide, accidents, and violence. These are socially, by and large, socially determined causes of de disease, whereas heart disease and cancer is up here. So when the prime minister says he's going to have a go at um, obesity by limiting advertising of fatty foods and so on, He's not going to impact very much on the health inequalities. It's down here, socially determined causes of death need a social response. And while, uh, as, while I was uh, as doing my master's in public health, I came across this term salutogenesis. As I say, doctors know all about pathogenesis, but this was the first time I had heard this word after about 20 years uh, from starting my medical degree. Salus was the Roman goddess of well-being and safety, and the uh, Scandinavian uh, School of Public Health had pulled together this slide, which shows about 25 different theories as to the causes of well-being under this umbrella of salutogenesis. And I'll just mention one or two of them. What some of them, well, what most of them, in fact, conclude is that the causes of well-being, wellness occurs in individuals who grow up to be optimistic, who feel they have a sense of control, that they control their own destiny internally, they're not at the whim of external events, they feel they can deal with those external events, they have a sense of purpose and meaning in life, they're confident in their ability to handle what the world throws at them, and that's often due to the fact that they have a supportive network round about them. Supportive family, nurturing family, safe and secure childhood. And one of them, Aaron Antonovsky, particularly struck home with me when I was reading it, when he said, Antonovsky was an American sociologist who spent a lot of his time uh, as a working in Israel, where he studied the health of adults whose children had been in concentration camps. Two thirds of them were damaged irrevocably by, the, by those uh, events, but one third of them had come through them very well. And what he concluded was that the ones who survived and had well-being were ones who had found the social and before they had gone into the concentration camps had found the social and physical environment that they grew up in to be comprehensible manageable and meaningful and he concluded that if you didn't have that experience you would be chronically stressed now of course this rings a bell with those of us who know michael marmot's whitehall study this slide shows daytime cortisol levels in higher grade civil servants, the purple lines here, which throughout the day are lower than the cortisol levels in the lower grade civil servants. Why should the higher grade people have lower stress levels? Well, one of the reasons might be this sense of control. If a minister asks a permanent secretary to do something he doesn't fancy doing, what's he do? He just gets someone further down the hierarchy to do it. So the folk at the lower end of the civil service have less control over their day-to-day -day workload and are more stressed by it. And there are a whole load of examples looking at children in orphanages who have high stress levels, etc.
The key thing about this chronic elevation in the stress response is that, it, it, particularly in children, is that it affects brain development. The brain responds to the chronic signaling it's getting of stressors by developing differently from those who grow up in a secure environment who are not stressed. And the key areas that, that change structure are the prefrontal cortex, the center of executive decision making, the bit of the brain that allows you to, to process information and decide how appropriately to, to respond to that. That does not develop so well in stressed young people. The amygdala, the bit of the brain that lights up when you're emotionally aroused, that becomes more active in stressed young people. So they're more anxious, aggressive, fearful. And the hippocampus does not develop so well. And the hippocampus is important for memory. So children who come from difficult backgrounds are more anxious, aggressive, fearful. They're less well able to learn at school because their memories are less well developed. And when they are fearful and anxious, they respond inappropriately often because their prefrontal cortex isn't developed so well. So these are the kids that get into trouble at school, they get into trouble when they leave school, and their lives begin on a downward spiral that often ends up with them in jail, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, we didn't just take this experimental work um, as um, gospel. We went out into the streets of Glasgow and we got volunteers to have their brains scanned. And I was quite taken with the response of some of them, you know, what, you, you want to scan my brain? You're going to prove I've got a brain. Can I get a certificate to tell me that, they would say. And, um, you know, these are these were young people that were constantly told they were useless. They were constantly told they were stupid. They were put down and they began to believe it. And that hopelessness, that learned hopelessness that 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 grew up with them determined a lot of the adverse outcome they would experience in later life. We also went on and we measured uh, this, did psychometric testing. One of the tests we did was uh, a choice reaction time where you flash up information on a computer and the computer measures the length of time you take to press the correct button. And what this showed is that more affluent Glaswegians, the dark bars here, where it took about 20, 200 milliseconds less time to press the correct button than the more deprived Glaswegians. And if 200 milliseconds doesn't sound very much, if you imagine two cars being driven side by side at 40 miles an hour and a child walks out into the road in front of them, the car being driven by the guy with the turbulent background will take about two car lengths longer to stop. Not because he's not paying attention, but because his brain processes the problems more slowly. So, we have a situation where we have large swathes of the population who have grown up with poverty and with parental mental illness, with adversity of one sort or of another, neglect, abuse and so on, who become, who develop this learned hopelessness, helplessness, and they begin to move down the social scale. Their, their, their opportunities become limited. How can you deal with that? Well, the first thing to say is that the brain structure that they, they, they live with is not irreversible. I don't have time to go into the, the science behind it, but Bruce McEwen, the late Bruce McEwen, a colleague from whom I learned a lot of this stuff in, in America, just before he died, had completed a study that showed that the brain development, the adverse brain development, could be reversed by things like physical activity, mindfulness, mentoring, support. And when you look at how we begin to help people get out of that difficult um, place they are in, loads of experiments, and I'll just mention two or three of them, loads of studies have shown how you do that. The Broadway experiment in the city of London looked at 13 rough sleepers with a four to 45 year history of rough sleeping. Now that's quite impressive because the average life expectancy of a rough sleeper wouldn't be much more than 45 years. 
And they decided that they couldn't get these rough sleepers off the streets by doing what they've always done, you know, sending social work to give them a voucher or whatever. They decided to set up a personalised budget for each of them with £3,000 in it. They offered them personalised support, a mentor, and the mentor's approach was, what matters to you? What do you need? What can I help you get that would make life better for you? And having that conversation build trust, relationships, a sense of control, a sense of self-esteem in that individual that gave them the ability to make choices. One of the first pers people that uh, she spoke to said, well, could you get me a new pair of spectacles? Because I like to read the papers that folk throw away and I've lost my specs. The most expensive thing anyone asked for was a guy who asked for, said the only time in his life he'd ever been happy was as a boy when his parents would take him to a caravan park in Kent. Could they see if there was a disused caravan there and he would go and live in it? A year later, 11 of the 13 were in permanent accommodation. A couple of them had sought training and were in jobs. And the average spend out of the 3,000 bank accounts was £800. In reviewing this, that left-wing drag, The Economist, concluded that the most efficient way to spend money on the homeless might be to give it to them. Well, there you go. Stoke on Trent did a really interesting study in which they used their data to identify about a thousand individuals in their area who were living really very turbulent and difficult lives. And they decided to set about doing the what matters to you approach, build the relationship, help the individual to feel good about themselves and help them move forward in life. The interesting thing they did was they costed the before and after cost to public services of those individuals. And beforehand, each individual was costing the public services about £100,000 a year, £80,000 in social services, three and a half in local authority costs. That would be housing, housing officers going in to fix broken windows and kicked in doors and so on. Health service costs, police costs. Afterwards, that £100,000 a year fell to £2,000 a year. Significant reductions in everything, and indeed the criminal justice costs virtually disappeared. The only public service that cost more was education, because more of the children in the houses were going to school more often. And I use this slide to be able to show this to politicians, actually, Invest in people, invest in this what matters to you approach, and it will save you money at the end of the day. We advocate it because it's the right thing to do. It's just and fair and shows compassion for our fellow citizens, but it also saves money. And in fact, these were um, total recorded crimes that fell significantly over the introduction of that uh, that, What's that, audio? that um, experience. Minimum universal basic income piloted in the US and Canada. Um, it, in Canada, it reduced domestic violence, better mental health, better hospitalizations down significantly, high school graduations up in New Jersey, and Richard Nixon, in fact, had a bill ready for Congress to make universal basic income a right for every American. However, this was torpedoed by the report that in Seattle, recipients of universal basic income experienced divorces at a huge rate of knots. 50% of them got divorced. And this was said, well, this is what happens when you make women financially independent from their husbands. They leave them. And the bill was pulled. And of course, that was crap. It was fake news. A few years later, someone went back and divorce rate in Seattle did not change. But of course, big business in America did not want money going to the poor. And Evelyn Forge, a Canadian who looked at this, said that universal basic income was ditched because the political right thought it would stop people working and the left didn't trust them to make their own choices. The evidence is support people help them 
don't tell them what to do and they will make their own choices and they will be for the better. One of the interesting financial aspects of this is that Mark Bellis, who runs the health uh, data system in Wales, has calculated the, the annual cost attributed to the outcome of in adults whose children had experienced adverse childhood events. The annual cost in Europe is about £581 billion and considerably more in North America. My calculation is that the cost to the NHS in Scotland from children having two or more aces is £3.9 billion a year. What's not to like politicians? You support families, you help them look after their children, and you will see far less pressure on the healthcare system, but you'll also see less pressure on social care, you'll see less pressure on prison, uh, uh, imprisonment of young people, instead of going to prison, will stick in at school, do well, and pay taxes. Joseph Townsend was a Church of England cleric, um, who was also a medical doctor, who is quoted as saying, hunger will tame the fiercest animals, it will teach decency, civility, obedience and subjection, it, only hunger which can spur and go to put on to labour. And I would suggest that if he were, he, if he were alive today, he'd be working for the Department of Work and Pensions. I also like to mention that as, uh, as, a, as I am a graduate of Glasgow University, uh, Joseph Townsend was a medical graduate of Edinburgh University. So we need to change attitudes in our public services if we are seriously going to tackle this. And the deep end practices are a beacon for this kind of move. Instead of having an existing system that's based on problems, find solutions, design services, does things to people rather than with them, run by and for professionals who have them, um, who have um, outcomes to meet and so on. And you deal with customers who consume services, but by all account, by all measures, they have to be efficient and keep, keep their bosses safe. What we need to do is move into a new system where we see that what matters to people is a good life, look for strengths, build support, let solutions emerge, and the whole system is run by a citizen who pulls for support rather than a professional who pushes solutions at them. And doing so, we build strong citizens and healthy communities. And that basically is the public health lesson of, of many years study into the whole thing that I, I can come up with. So I'll just stop there. Thanks very much.